Hi, this is Joe Montana. This is Dak Prescott. Hey, this is Jason Kelsey, and you're listening to Rob Motti. Rob Motti. Rob Motti. I am Rob Motti, and welcome to the AP Pro Football Podcast. My guest this week is two-time Super Bowl champion Jim McMahon, who quarterbacked the 1985 Chicago Bears to an 18-1 and season capped by a 46-10 win over the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. We talk about his career, his relationship with Mike Ditka, his time playing with the Eagles, the Vikings, Chargers, Cardinals. He played all around the NFL after his time in Chicago. He also overcame an addiction to painkillers and much more. It's a fascinating conversation, so stay tuned for that. The Eagles and Colts agreed on a trade last week that sends Carson Wentz to Indy and reunites him with Frank Reich. The Eagles get a third-round pick in this year's draft, a conditional second-round pick next year, that will become a first-round pick if Carson Wentz plays 70% of the snaps and the Colts make the playoffs or 75% of the snaps, and then it doesn't matter if the Colts make the playoffs or not. I thought it was a decent deal for Philly given Wentz is coming off the worst season of his career, and there's no guarantee that he will go back to his Pro Bowl form. But the fact that the Eagles got to this point where they fired head coach Doug Peterson three years after winning a Super Bowl and traded Carson Wentz less than two years after giving him a $128 million four-year contract extension that hasn't even kicked in yet. The fact that they got to this point is a colossal organizational failure. Man played 15 seasons in the NFL, the first seven with the Chicago Bears. He helped lead them to a Super Bowl title in 1985, and he was one of the most fascinating athletes in sports. He's a dynamic personality. Here is my conversation with Jim McMahon. Jim, first off, I want to talk to you about the Super Bowl season with the Chicago Bears, the incredible defense that you guys had that year, what you were able to do offensively to lead that team at what point when you look back at that season you guys got off to that incredible start 11 and 0 did you realize that this is something special that we have here and we could win it all well i think that started late in 1983 actually you know we we weren't very good in my first two years 82 83 uh but i think we won seven of the last eight in 83 then in 84, of course, we went to the NFC Championship game. So we knew we, were, we knew we had a good football team. So coming into 85, we expected to win. And, uh, you know, we worked. I mean, Dick worked our ass off. And uh, we worked hard, and, and we got it done in 85. But we – yeah, you're right. We had a, a great defense. Uh, you know, it was a fairly new defense at the time. You know, Buddy was just kind of implementing – he'd been trying to implement it for years, but he just didn't have the players to plug in there because you – You've got to have some skilled players on that defense, especially your cornerbacks, uh, which didn't get enough credit, I don't think. We had Leslie Frazier, uh, who's now with the Buffalo Bills, doing a great job, but uh, and Mike Richardson at the corners for us. And those guys were on an island every week, you know, pretty much every play every week, and uh, they did a hell of a job. You know, luckily the the front seven usually would get to the quarterback anyway, but. Uh, if they didn't, uh, these guys made made great plays. You know, Leslie was still, <clears throat> I consider him the best uh, cornerback that I've ever seen. And I went up against him for, you know, the, the four years before he got hurt in the Super Bowl. And uh, I thought he was the best corner I'd ever seen. It was unfortunate what happened to him in the Super Bowl. What were those practices like? Because yeah, you got Mike Singletary, right, and linebacker, Wilbur Marshall, those guys – when you're lining up against your own defense in practice, what were some of those practices like? You got any stories from those times? Well, that was – we played pretty much four games a week. Uh, <laughs> we, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we, we always had pads on. Every, every uh, situation was a live situation. We had no – there was no buddy-buddy periods where, hey, uh, you know, this is what we're going to do. You know, take it easy on me. Uh, everything was live. You know, Mike Dick and Buddy Ryan uh, – we're feuding pretty much every day. And so they took it out on us. And um, it, it's amazing to me that we won so many games because we, we beat the hell out of each other in practice for the seven years that I was there. 
we look at that and, you know, from the outside, looking at that feud between Buddy and, and Ditka, like, it couldn't be that real. It couldn't be that bad. But what, you lived it. What, what was that like? And how, how were they able to, to overcome whatever differences they had and, and be able to go out there and, and you guys could produce? Well, it was it was really a tale of two teams. Uh, you know, they did their thing, we did our thing, and and we came together on Sunday and won. And uh, yeah, it was very it was very real. I think Buddy, I think Buddy thought he was going to get the head job in '82, uh, and then you know all of a sudden Mike Dick is the head coach. It was my first year as well, and so I I kind of. I entered into that the same time Dick did, you know, yeah, he didn't, I think he knew about Buddy Ryan, but, um, you know, I, I just remember defensive guys telling me that, you know, Ditka walked into a defensive meeting one, you know, one of the first days and, and Buddy says, get the hell out of here. I run the defense. And so, <laughs> you know, there was really no respect for the head coach on the defensive side, I don't think. And, uh, and Buddy, I think George Hallis had given Buddy a lifetime contract. So he knew he couldn't get fired. And I think he took good advantage of that. You think Ditka got a little uh, irritated or bothered when the defensive guys carried Buddy off the field after you guys beat the Patriots in a Super Bowl? Uh, I don't know if that bothered him or not. I, you know, I, I think it was a great tribute. I mean, Buddy was – he was a hell of a coach. He, he changed offensive football in the NFL because, you know, the West Coast offense came into being because if you didn't get rid of the ball in three steps, you're going to get hit. I mean, that was his philosophy. Uh, he wanted to take the, you know, the starting quarterback. If he, if he wasn't out by the first quarter, he was pissed off at his defense. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, he was there in Philly with you. You saw it. I mean, yeah. the, the feud that he had with the Cowboys and the kicker there. I mean, it, <laughs> and I, fell, I fell in love with football watching that defense. So it, it was pretty cool. When I look back at that Super Bowl, I remember Walter Payton. You guys had, I think, four rushing touchdowns. So we had one. You you had you had you might I had, had two, two right you had two had and the two. fridge had one and I go ah oh, shoot in a blowout like that like Walter didn't get and I don't think he was the kind of guy who would say anything to anyone about it did you ever feel like uh, darn we didn't give him the ball to, to get in the end zone or did you never it didn't even matter to him well no it it mattered a lot I found yeah. that out you know years years and years later that it mattered that much to him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the time, you know, we we came in at halftime yelling, hey, let's put 50, 60 on these guys. And we, you know, Dick is like, yeah, let's do it. And I think we were all out of the game by the, or most of us were out of the game and, you know, in the fourth quarter. And, uh, you know, Walter carried, I think, 27 times in that game. And I think he could have carried it 100 and not gotten in because mm -hmm. that was their focus. You know, that was their whole focus. That You know, they talked about it all week. We stopped Walter Payton, we went. And uh, they, they did a good job of, of stopping Walter, but we had a lot of talent on offense. And, you know, he opened up the way for a lot of guys to, you know, do what they did in that game. And so him not scoring, to me, you know, doesn't belittle him at all. I mean, he was a great football player. And because of his greatness, that's why we were able to, to do what we did on offense that day. The Bears still had a, a great team for a couple more years, and just for whatever reason, things would happen. You had a, you went through a lot of injuries, and in '86 you started only six games. Same thing in in '87, of course, the strike year. Why do you think you guys weren't able to, with that team still intact? I know Buddy left and Buddy went to Philly. weren't able to, to get another one. Well, you know the. In 85, we were 15 and one. Yeah. 86, we were 14 and two. You know, we had the best record in football again. It wasn't like we went away. Uh, you know, that's the year I, I uh, dislocated my throwing shoulder in the opening ball game. I should have never played again. Should have had surgery right away. But I kept getting misinformation from the doctors and so forth. And I kept trying to play through it. You know, they brought in Doug Flutie there at the end, started him in the playoff game against Washington. Uh, I think, you know, Joe Gibbs was the first guy to to fit, kind of figure out how to beat Buddy's defense. You know, you, you block up eight guys, you, you run two-man routes, and, and you hope for the best. And, and uh, they were able to beat us two years in a row at home in the playoffs because of it, the way he did that. Uh, so in 80, 87, you mentioned the strike year. Uh, I was on injured reserve anyway the first half of the year, so I was kind of happy there was a strike going on. Um, 
you know, they told me, my doctor told me it would take me two years to play again after my surgery. And I was playing in uh, 11 months. So, you know, I, I went through three days, three times a day uh, rehab and, and worked my ass off to get back because I knew we were going to be good again. Um, and and uh, we ended up losing the divisional playoff game at home against Washington. And then in 88, I think we had the best record in the league again. Uh, we lost the NFC championship game at home to the 49ers. So, you know, it wasn't like we went away. It's just that we didn't take advantage of, of home field advantage in the playoffs like most teams do. <laughs> you mentioned the, the shoulder. You went through so many different injuries throughout the course of your career. Uh, concussions, right? You, you had all of it. Guys don't play now through some of those injuries that you suffered. Like I, I was reading stories about you when offensive linemen had to pick you up and put you back, like in the huddle and they can't hear you. You're having trouble breathing. Like when you think back about that and you go like, I mean, that's the epitome of being a tough guy. Do you have any regrets, Jim? Uh, you know, if there, if there was any way that I could walk out on that field and play, I was going to play whether it took shots, pain pills, uh, you know, I was going to play until I couldn't play anymore. Uh, you know, I hurt my kidney in 84, got the bottom third of it torn off. Uh, I played uh, one more play in that series. Then I sat there through halftime and started the second half. And so, you know, that's just how we did it back, th back then. And plus, you know, we weren't getting paid a hell of a lot. You know, a lot of my, a lot of my contracts were incentive laden, especially after I left the Bears. I would sign one-year deals with everybody, and, and, and a lot of it was incentive. And so I had to play. You know, I had four little or three little kids at the time. And, and uh, like I said, I was the fifth, fifth player taken in the first round from the Bears, and I was making less money than some second-rounders. So I wasn't getting paid a hell of a lot. Uh, so that's, that's the reason I got out there and played. I did, you know, I didn't care. You know, I, I had a broken throwing hand in 1984 before I hurt my kidney. Uh, so for six games, they would shoot my throwing hand and I, my hand would be numb. You know, I'm throwing the ball end, on, end over end and, and people are, you know, saying, hey, how come you can't throw a spiral? I said, well, I can't feel the ball for one, you know. Uh, but, you know, we weren't allowed to tell the press back then, you know, what was going on. You know, I, I, I had a broken hand and they told me it was a bruise. I went to the hospital the night after I broke it and the guy says, your hand's broke. And I said, I knew it. And so they casted it. I showed up to practice the next morning and they, they were all over me. You got to cut that off. You can't let anybody know you're hurt. Oh, wow. well, they're going to figure it out eventually when the ball's going like this, like it was. <laughs> and I finally said, hey, I can't feel my hand because it's been shot six weeks in a row. I, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky I'm getting it there. It's not looking pretty, but it was getting there. I remember a game you played against the Browns when you got to Philly. I think you threw for over 300 yards. But what stood out to me was your your elbow or your shoulder. I don't know what hurt so much, but you made a comment afterwards that it hurt so bad. You had a ponytail at the time. And one of the offensive linemen, Ron Heller. Ronnie, Ronnie Heller. He had, he had to put my tail in for me. <laughs> what, what was going on? What happened? What was that? Well, again, I the uh, team doctor was telling me I had tendonitis in my elbow. And I found out later I had a... I had the, uh, it was broken two places and one of my tendons was down on my forearm somewhere. And so uh, I remember getting there to Cleveland stadium that morning, my elbow was almost as big as your head. And it was just, <laughs> cause I tried to, they shot it on Friday practice to see if I could play. And then I, it, it didn't react well, or I just, I, I heard it more and it, it was just, it was huge. And, uh, the trainer was massaging it and putting all this, you know, his grandma's concoction on there, mustard root, all this kind of stuff to try to get the swelling out. Um, he got it down about halfway and then he, they shot it up and I played. I mean, that's like I said, that's the way we used to do it. And uh, didn't start out real well. I remember we got down. It was 20. What the hell was it? 24, 23 to nothing at the time. And uh, we ended up coming back and winning that game. But uh yeah, I don't don't remember a lot of it because I had a bunch of painkillers in me. And like I said, they shot the arm up. It was numb until I got on the bus back to the airport. Of all your accomplishments, I, I don't know if you even know this one. You won 25 straight starts at one point in your career. I think it was 84 to 87, somewhere in there, including the playoffs and the Super Bowl. I know Peyton Manning went on and won 23 regular season games, but he lost a wild card game 
So you had 25 straight wins. It, is that one of your favorite, most you know, greatest accomplishments, or is it the Super Bowl season? What, when you look back, which one is it? No, winning, winning was always the most important to me. I didn't, you know, stats were, you know, I would love to throw in the ball, you know, 400 uh, yards a game like I used to do in college and, you know, five or six touchdowns a game. But winning was the, the main focus. And uh, I was proud of my winning percentage. I mean, we, like I said, we weren't very good early on in Chicago. We won some games we probably shouldn't have. Uh, I would have liked to stay healthy to, to get all those wins that, that we had when I wasn't playing. And, uh, you know, we talked about the Eagles a little bit. In 91, we should have won it all. I mean, hell, we had the best defense in the league. And, and uh, you know, we finished 10 and 6 and didn't go to the playoffs. So I kept going to spots where I thought we had a good chance to, to carry on and get to the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, from, from Philly, I ended up in Minnesota, went to the playoffs there. Uh, and then the next, you know, three years was, was kind of boring. I did pick up an, another ring with Green Bay in 96. That was kind of nice. But, uh, yeah, I, I, w- I would have rather played than sit there and watch the other guys. What was that dynamic like when you first came to Philly and you, Buddy brings you in as a backup to Randall? And, and before that year, before the 91 year where you had to play because he tore his ACL and they went 8-3 with you and the defense and everything. The year prior, they made the you guys make the playoffs. You lose to the Redskins. And he put you in for a series. Remember that? He put you in for a series. I kind of mean, it was a 20 to 6 game, 26 loss. What was your relationship like with Randall? He's grown and matured a lot since then. But back then, you recall any of that? Well, yeah. I mean, back then, um, I think Randall wanted to be more like, um, who was the guy on TV? Um, Arsenio Hall. You know, he had his own TV show. You know, he cut his hair like him and... He, he he really enjoyed that that part of it, the limelight. Um, you know, he was a hell of a talent. I mean, that guy could throw the ball over the stadium. He could kick it. He could run. Uh, but offensive football has got to be structured. You know, if, if one guy screws up on offense, your play's not going to work. Uh, defensively, you know, one guy can screw up, but they're, they're such great athletes they can make up for it. But if one guy screws up on, in a, on a play on offense, you don't have a good play. And, um, you know, Randall liked to do, you know, run around and do his own thing. And uh, it's tough to it's tough to play consistent football like that. you're going to make some some big plays for sure, which he did. But, uh, you know, it's going to hurt you come down the road when you, when you have to make, you know, you have to make the plays you're supposed to make. You are a character, man. I mean, people like you would all, there was always con- some one controversy after another involving Jim McMahon. Obviously, the one that stood out to me, and you might get a kick out of this. So as a kid growing up in Philly playing football, I lived across the street from a park. We'd go out there, and then the one, you show up with the headband and then the Roselle thing, and then all of a sudden we're playing touch football, rough touch football, tackle football. We're all wearing headbands because a guy in Chicago, not even in Philly, a guy in Chicago, Jim McMahon's doing that and doing it to the commissioner of the NFL. What was all of that like? What was that experience like? What was the fun, you know, that you had? I know Roselle say, sent you, he didn't rescind the fine, but he said that was funny as hell that you said that, that you wore a headband with his name on it. Well, I was, I was trying to make a point. I mean, I, I found out later they didn't really have the right to find me the first time. Wow. Uh, you know, I had been wearing that headband for a year, at least a year, and nobody said a word to me. And I didn't, I didn't realize at the time the Adidas wasn't paying the NFL. That's why they got mad at me. And they said I was giving them free advertising. I said, no, I'm not the one zooming in on my head or my shoes or whatever else I've got on that was Adidas. But, uh, you know, I did those things and people thought I was nuts, but I always understood the game. You know, I, I understood offense and defense. And and uh, so I was always confident in my ability out there. So what I did off the field, it wasn't it was basically for me to get through the day to have some fun. I mean, because. A football day is very boring. I mean, you start at eight o'clock or usually at seven because I got to get there for treatment. And then you sit in meetings for a couple hours, you know, and then you go out and you, you do your little walkthrough. Then you come in and have lunch and you go back into meetings and you go back to practice. And, you know, for, it's an eight to five job or eight to six. And it's very boring. So I, I try to do things to, uh, you know, amuse myself and, and get me through the day. And I try to show that to my teammates. I say, it doesn't matter what you do during the week. I said, what matters is what you do on Sunday. 
if you, if you understand that, if you understand what you're supposed to be doing, you can have some fun. Jim, how closely do you look at today's NFL? Do you, do you watch the NFL no. nowadays? And, and do you think you could have played in this era? I would have loved to play in this era. You know, hell, they can't even touch the quarterback anymore. And, and everybody's, it's pretty much a seven on seven league. And that's, you know, that's what I did in college. I mean, back in the seventies, we were throwing the ball like this. And, uh, you know, I got to Chicago and it was probably the most boring offense I'd ever been in in my life after coming from BYU. Uh, and there was not an offense that I played in that was as good as BYU of the seven teams that I played with in the pros. Uh, I was with Mike Holmgren uh, in Green Bay my last year and a half. And that was a, that was as close to BYU offense as I, I had seen. And that wasn't even <laughs> very close to it. So, yeah, I would have loved to love to play in this area. I mean, that, that's what that's what I did. So. You know, be able to spread people out. I can tell you who's coming and who ain't, and it's very simple. To to, to me, it was. What do you think of guys now being able? You guys didn't have that freedom. Guys now can can dictate where they want to go. Guys now can demand trades and and go wherever they want to. There's free agency, obviously changed a lot of that. How do you feel about that aspect of it? Well, I went through two strikes, so these guys can do what the hell they want to do now. You know, and make what they're make what they're making so uh you know it's tough to to put that together a cohesive unit you know year after year because of that you know but i think if you keep your your you know i always said i don't care who else you got just give me a good offensive line because those are the guys that win games for you uh doesn't matter to me who my receivers or running backs were you give me five guys up there that know what the hell they're doing we'll win games and uh so I would I would start with that. Just keep those guys together, and you know everybody else is interchangeable. You played in Chicago, Philly, San Diego, Minnesota, Arizona, Green Bay. Favorite don't, team don't to forget beat. Cleveland. I, oh, I, Cleveland, yeah. Ten, <laughs> ten really fun weeks in Cleveland with that guy, uh, whatever the hell his name was. What was your favorite city to play in, fan base? When you when you look back at it, and I'm, I'm Bears have a. <laughs> really rabid fan base. Philly's got a passionate fan base. Minnesota's got their, you know, what did, where did you enjoy the most? Uh, well, everywhere I got to play, you know, because no matter what city you're in, it's pretty much the same during the season. And uh, like I said, you get to work at eight or seven and you get home at six. There's really not a hell of a lot to do. Uh, I enjoyed San Diego because of the weather was great. Uh, I enjoyed Arizona. When I played for Arizona in 94, I said, this is where I'm going to live when I retire. And that's where I'm at now. Moved out here 11 years ago. Uh, it's dry heat feels good on the body. Uh, <laughs> don't do humidity well. Don't do the cold well. So this, is, uh, this has been a pretty good spot. During your career and after, I, I know there was, obviously, with all the injuries, concussions, everything you had. Did you ever do – was there – an addiction to painkillers? Were you taking too much? And, and what happened? How did you eventually get out of that? Oh, yeah, I was I was eating uh, at least 100 perks a month just to, you know, function, uh, get out of as bed. A player, get Jim, as a player or after? Uh, as a player and then a after for about, uh, uh, I'd say at least five years. So probably nine, early 2000s is when I, that's the last time I took a painkiller. Uh, when I moved out here to Arizona, I got my medical marijuana license and I've been exclusively using, uh, that since I haven't, you know, I, my body feels a hell of a lot better. My mind is a lot clearer. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a natural, it's a medicinal herb. I mean, we're supposed to be using it. And so yeah, it's, it's done me, done me wonders. I spoke to director Stephen Wallace last week about, the documentary that he's doing, Mad Mac, The Memory of Jim McMahon, and it covers your life in and, and out of sports. When you were approached with that, what did you think? Because it's a, to me, it's a really cool thing to see. Well, he, he uh, contacted me and he said he wanted to do this, a different version of, of all the other things that uh, has been uh, recorded about me, I guess. So, uh, what it's going to look like, I have no idea. He was uh, he filmed here for three days in my house. Uh, he's he, I know he's talked to a bunch of my ex teammates, some other people. 
uh, you know, like Joe Namath, I believe uh, Bill Murray, guys like that. So I'm excited to see it myself. I think he's going to end filming in April. Uh, the Murray brothers have a uh, their Caddyshack tournament down in Florida. Yeah. And I think it's her 20th anniversary this year, and I'm hoping to make it. My son's getting married just before that. So I'm hoping to get down there, and he said he'll wrap up filming then and then edit. I don't know how long it'll take him to edit, and then uh, we'll see what happens. What do you want people to get out of it? When people think about the, the life and legacy of, of Jim McMahon, the quarterback, the character, the personality, what do you want people to get out of that? Well, hopefully they'll see a different side. I mean, you know, the media can make you look foolish or they can make you look great. I mean, it's, it's all about editing, as you know. So, uh, but I think what they'll, what they'll figure out is that I, I was a player. I wanted to play. I, you know, I did whatever I, I had to do to play and I was prepared. I understood the game and uh, the guys that were in my huddle understood that they knew, they knew I knew what the hell I was doing. So, uh, you know, Dick sometimes didn't think that, but uh, he thought I'd do things just to piss him off. But, I'm like, I'm out here trying to win games, man. And uh, what you're sending in ain't going to get it done sometimes. So I didn't, I, I, I would have loved to play with that guy. He was a great football player. But uh, had he been in my huddle, he would have understood me. Because uh, we both wanted to win. That's all we want to do is win. And we just had, you know, different ideas how to get that done. Well, you did win. You won the big one with him. Did you have a better relationship after you left Chicago and, and maybe now looking back with this, could you have any relationship with him at all now? Oh yeah. I see him every once in a while. It's been about uh, two years and a hundred, hundred year anniversary. I was there uh, in Chicago for that. Got to see him then. Um, oh yeah. It's, it's great now. You know, he's, <laughs> we're, we're almost friends now. It's great. <laughs> now his wife, his wife always told me, she said, man, he really likes you. I'm like, well, why does he cuss at me for three hours a day? You know, <laughs> And she goes, you guys are just too much alike. You know, I, I, like I said, I said, well, we, we both want to win and we'll do whatever it takes to, to do that. So uh, hopefully that's what the people will get out of this. That, you know, that's I was a winner. I just wanted to play ball, win and, and, and have fun at, at doing it. You know, they, like I said, you can have some fun in this if you if you understand what you're doing when it's game time. The league is trying to help players not reach the point that you were at where you were taking a hundred perks a day or, or a month or whatever it was to get through it, trying to help them not develop addictions to painkillers and everything else. Do you, when you see what's happening now, is it encouraging to you that they're taking these steps to make sure players don't go through that? Well, I, I've heard they've changed the rules. Now. I don't know if, if you guys can use uh, marijuana or not, but uh, I think it's headed in the right direction, but you know, big farmers tied into to everything. You know? They, they don't mind these guys taking because they're giving them free, probably. And uh, they don't mind taking them, let them take that. But you know, when the guy goes home and he can't sleep at night, why can't he just relax and, you know, try some, have some cannabis and, and be able to sleep? Uh, you know, I, I, I used throughout my whole career. I never failed a drug test. Uh, you know, we, we always knew when our test was going to be. It was going to be when you came to training camp, right? So the guys that, that enjoyed marijuana. I, I've been using since 1973. So I've always, I never knew how good it was for me until I met these doctors. And they, they told me all about how you have the endocannabinoid system and all this and that. So now that I know it's great for me, I, I'm, I'm, that's why I continue with it. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we'd stop at June 1st, give ourselves 45 days to clean out. That's the reason it stays in your body so long because we've been depraved of it and your body craves this stuff. It, it wants it in there. And so uh, we, We'd be clean for our test. And then after that, the rules were that the only thing they could bust you for, uh, for the, uh, if you had a random test, was steroids. So you can, you know, you can have anything in your system after that first test. And they couldn't, they couldn't do anything unless it was a steroid. So, uh, but now we all know how good it is for us. So it's, it's all mute at this point. What about that procedure? I, I read about a procedure you had on your neck with a doctor in, in New York. I mean, how much did that help you? Oh, that's been a lifesaver for me. In fact, I just went back, uh, uh, it was about a week and a half ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I was actually down at the, uh, or down near the Super Bowl. I was at Johnny Damon's uh, golf event. 
down in Orlando. And then uh, I must have slept wrong or something that night and got up and played golf. I could not move my head. I, I got home Sunday night. I called my doctor right away. I said, Doc, I need to see you. And he says, OK, I'll, I'll be in Albany on Thursday. That's where I usually meet him. And this is Sunday night. And I said, Doc, I don't think I can go four more days like this. I mean, I, I literally couldn't move. I couldn't turn turn my body. Uh, ended up making it there. And he said, man, this is the worst I've ever seen it. He had to adjust me twice, actually. But it uh, feels pretty good now. But uh, I, was a, I was a mess uh, a week and a half ago. I'm looking forward, Jim, to the documentary. This was an absolute pleasure. I'm glad we got to get her done. Thank you. Time for some final thoughts as the NFL heads into free agency in three weeks. Trade speculation heats up. A reminder, don't believe everything you hear. Agents and teams will often feed misleading and just flat-out false information to push a narrative that benefits them or their client. That's it for this week. Thank you to Jim McMahon. Please be sure to download, subscribe to the podcast, tell a friend, review, do all of that stuff. We're on iTunes and wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next week, I'm Rob Motti reminding you, make a difference, be a blessing.